Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. to another episode of Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. So as a reminder, this podcast really gives us a good opportunity as DNR staff to give you, the listener, kind of an inside look at what happens behind the scenes, both with our staff in the field, um, in the office, and everything that they're doing on a daily basis to kind of improve your time in the woods, uh, whether you like to hunt, fish, camp, hike, um, or just enjoy nature. So we've got a really exciting one today here. Um, It's late October here. We're getting ready. The rut's about to start here pretty quick. So we're going to be joined by Eric Canania, uh, who is a deer biologist with Wisconsin DNR, and Anna Brose, who's the assistant deer and elk ecologist with Wisconsin DNR. And we're going to be talking about deer behavior and movement. So um, everything from kind of deer as a whole and how they behave in the woods to kind of a, a seasonal look at how they're moving, why they're moving, and then how you guys, whether you're hunting, um, taking photos in the wild, how you can use that information to kind of tailor your hunt or tailor your trip to see in deer. So before we get started here, why don't you guys just give some brief background. Um, Eric, we'll start with you. Hey everybody, as Sawyer mentioned, I'm Eric Cannon and I'm the Southern District Tier Biologist located out of the Dodgeville DNR office. I grew up in Southwest portion of Illinois and was raised in an area rich with outdoor opportunities and pretty much grew up deer hunting. So it is definitely my passion and uh, drove my career choice. So can you describe your position as a deer biologist? So you work in a region then, right? Yeah, I cover 18 counties within the Southern District and pretty much anything deer related um, is part of my uh, part of my workload. I cover mainly sick deer and CWD work, the DMAP program, CDACs, as well as some quota setting process and outreach. Perfect. Anna, how about you? I'm stationed here out of Madison. I'm the assistant deer and elk ecologist, which means that I help do a lot of the administrative side of managing our deer and elk populations in Wisconsin. I help publish the hunting regulations, I manage our websites, I answer questions from the public. Um, I grew up in Alaska hunting big game and recently moved to Wisconsin, so this is my first year deer hunting here. First year hunting whitetails and I'm really excited to to get into it and talk about some of the things we've learned here today. Great, so like I said we've got um, Eric who works mostly in the field, Anna who works in the office, both doing incredibly important things relative to the deer program. Um, so I thought maybe we'd just get started. So white-tailed deer, obviously whether you're a hunter or not, if you live in Wisconsin, probably you're familiar with this animal. Um, you know what it looks like. You've seen it a million times probably. Can you guys give maybe just a brief overview of white-tailed deer as a species? Certainly. So white-tailed deer are the most widely hunted and studied big game species in North America. They're generalist and edge species and have uh, great adaptability Um, The ability to uh, thrive in multiple ecosystems and climate as well. And no surprise, due to those features, their adaptability, um, advancements in farming, removal of apex predators, and uh, a warming climate, there are actually more deer today on the landscape than there were in pre-settlement times. So can you, maybe we'll back up a little bit there. So when you say generalist and edge species, Eric, what does that mean? And Anna, feel free to chime in here too. So in terms of being generalist, they thrive in multiple ecosystems and habitat types, specifically edge types are where multiple habitats converge and come together. So whereas most species uh, don't do well with broken up habitats, white-tailed deer seem to thrive in it. So would that be the equivalent of like a a farm field meeting a forest or, or what would be an example of edge habitat? A farm field, meeting a forest, uh, CRP land, wetland, anything where you have multiple habitat types that come together, that's converging habitat, it's edge, and deer love it. 
Yeah, deer really like to have options in their habitat. They like to have heavy cover for bedding, but they also like some open areas for feeding. So anywhere you can find where they've got those multiple habitat options and quarters that they're moving between those those types of habitat is, is really valuable habitat for deer. So you mentioned they're, they're kind of easily adaptable too. So can you maybe give an example of that? So obviously there are, there are places that are going to be prime time deer habitat, but obviously we see deer in urban situations, in cities, um, along highways, things like that. Cause so can you maybe talk about how they are able to adapt to kind of some of those different situations? Well, deer, um, they can consume up to 100 different species annu annually. Most of their uh, consumptions of vegetation and plants are seasonal based, but because of that wide range of uh, vegetation they're able to consume and break down, they can thrive in urban settings where they're eating on ornamentals or in a park-like uh, environment or a heavily forested area where it's predominantly uh, natural forbs and brows, mass products, um, all, all the way to agricultural settings where you're, they're consuming soybeans, alfalfa, corn, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So other than human hunters, do they have any kind of primary predators in the state? Yeah, there's a number of uh, predators we have here in Wisconsin that will uh, predate on deer, a couple being coyotes, bobcats, wolves, and uh, black bears. Mm -hmm. So I think, can you guys talk about maybe the relation between that and I think a lot of people might take for granted how many deer are, hunted, are harvested by human hunters and are hit by cars versus kind of predators. Is that connection kind of closer than people think or is the, that number just really way off? vast majority of the deer are harvested by human hunters and uh, are hit by roadkill, are hit by vehicles and deer vehicle collisions as compared to uh, predation events. So um, on average, I think we bounce in between the last couple of years, three to 400,000 deer harvested annually by hunters. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that gives a good background. Is there anything else maybe you guys wanted to add for kind of deer as a species just in general to kind of set the tone? They can travel long distances or stay in small areas depending on their habitat and whims. So they're really variable species and people need to remember that as they're encountering them mm -hmm. in the field. So what role do deer play kind of in a given ecosystem? You, you guys mentioned that they're kind of generalists. They can move all, move all around from city, uh, big timber, things like that. So can you guys touch on what role they play in an ecosystem? Well, we kind of touched on some of it already. Like you said, um, they're generalists. They're also a prey species, which we already talked about. Um, they can, they really thrive in those edge habitats, which means that they can um, maintain some early successional vegetation by browsing young growth, which can be really beneficial to other species. Eric, you have anything to add? Yeah, largely white-tailed deer are considered to be ecological engineers due to their ability to impact and modify forest succession as well as vegetative communities in a wide range of ecosystems. So depending on the de density of white-tailed deer population, they could, be, they could have positive and or negative impacts in the landscape. So a couple terms there. I'm going to have you, I'm gonna have you rewind again and maybe explain that one a little bit. So um, can you explain the term you use there for deer? Ecological engineers? Yep, that's the one. Yeah, um, so, yeah, basically they have the ability to impact the environment um, based off of the density of white-tailed deer. So if uh, there's high density of white-tailed deer, then they can severely um, have a negative impact to the environment. And uh, we, we tend to see that um, deer populations at intermediate densities or densities that are in balance with the habitat tend to show and yield positive results on the vegetation and other organism, organisms. Uh, we can expect to see maximum diversity whenever white-tailed deer population are in balance with the habitat. So are, are there any telltale signs of when it might be time to take a look at reducing the deer population in a given area? Is, are there ways you can tell? Certainly. Um, once you, uh, once you start exhibiting a, a hard browse line on some of your preferred uh, browse species, that's a telltale sign as well as an ecological shift uh, 
from uh, maybe you once had a forest stand that was predominantly oak and is shifting to a beech maple um, setting. Uh, deer can rapidly reduce preferred browse species and sh transition the habitat to a non-preferred species that isn't beneficial to other wildlife as well as isn't beneficial to uh, forestry in an economic standpoint. So you mentioned browse line there. I'm going to have you explain that one too. So a browse line is roughly um, any browse that has occurred from the ground level to about six feet tall. So sometimes on the side of uh, roadways or fieldways, you'll see um, all the vegetation in a tree that is removed from the ground level all the way up to about six feet tall. And that's what we consider a browse line. And once a, a sapling gets above the browse line, that's when it's really uh, has the ability to express itself and make leaps and gains in terms of growth. And then you also mentioned kind of it can lead to non-preferred species. So can you explain that a little bit of how kind of overbrowse or what would be determined the deer um, eating up to that six foot level of kind of those young, that young forest, what negative effects can that have? So if you have a forest stand that's predominantly like an oak forest habitat, that oak forest habitat benefits a wide range of other species. And when you have significant deer browse and you're impacting regeneration, that will start to shift the landscape dynamic more into maybe, a, let's say, a maple, a maple stand that doesn't have as much benefiting factors to other wildlife, isn't as productive in terms of uh, forestry products. And um, over time, this can happen. And once you start seeing these changes between the habitat types, we, we can usually tell that they're associated to high deer densities and increased browse level. Yeah, deer, just like people, have plants that they prefer to eat, just like we might prefer ice cream over broccoli. They have food that they prefer. So over time, like Eric said, they can actually impact the, the species of trees that you're seeing in your stand. So landowners or managers can observe the deer in their area and kind of figure out which plants they're choosing to eat over others. And if you're really looking to regenerate some of those preferred species, you can protect them using t tr tree tubes or something like that. And I think that really circles back in with what Eric mentioned earlier be because he said they're kind of that ecological engineer. So if you've, what I'm understanding is if you've got too many deer in an area, um, if they overbrowse, it's not only going to affect the ability of deer to thrive in that area, but it has that kind of spider web effect on a bunch of other species. Yeah, that's exactly right, Sawyer. So deer are also considered an umbrella species, which means when you're managing for quality deer habitat, you're going to be benefiting a wide range of other species underneath it with a kind of a trickle-down effect. Oftentimes it's hard to get funding or momentum behind, let's say, uh, managing for a, a particular species of songbird, um, but you get funding and momentum for increasing and improving white-tailed deer habitat, oftentimes you'll subsequently benefit uh, multiple species as well underneath it. So I, I think it was really important what you guys just covered there. I think we got a little bit off track, but I think that's going to be useful kind of as we move forward and talk about deer behavior because I think it's important to understand the effects that they can have on an ecosystem and just how wide-ranging those effects can be based on um, the number of deer, the quality of habitat, and things like that. Is there anything you guys wanted to add, kind of anything more background on deer, um, their role in an ecosystem before we kind of get into a year in the life of a deer? Let's do it. All right. So for our listeners, as a reminder, we're with Eric Cannonia and Anna Bros, and today we're talking about kind of general deer behavior um, and how that affects an ecosystem. Um, and what people can look for to kind of use some of this info to their advantage. So I thought maybe we'd start, well, why don't we start with a little more general question. So um, you mentioned deer can travel a long way. So over the course of a year, are they going to be frequenting um, consistent habitat and consistent places over the course of a year for the most part, or are they going to be moving around quite a bit? I think it depends on the deer and it depends on which area of the state and what kind of habitat they're in. Um, 
Eric can chime in too, but does primarily will stay in a smaller home range and won't do as much exploration. They'll typically stay a little bit closer to where they were born and raised, unless for some reason the habitat there isn't suitable. Um, bucks tend to disperse a little bit farther and can even go on pretty long foraging trips where they're exploring new habitat. And sometimes they'll circle right back and come back to where they were, but other times they'll disperse into to completely foreign habitat. So when you say long foraging trip, do you do you guys have a feel for maybe how long that could be? I'm just trying to kind of put it in put it in reference for kind of the people listening. So for instance, if they hunt a a 40 acre parcel, so would it be outside of that or? I think it generally on average, and this average is kind of a loaded term as well because it depends on the individual as well as the habitat, but um, a general. Um, white buck home range is about one square mile, and sometimes it can be greater, sometimes it can be less, depending on the quality of habitat. If they need to travel farther to acquire their daily needs, then they'll do so, but if the habitat's high, then they won't have to do so. But um, we're doing a study right now in the southwest part of the state, Southwest Deer and Predator Project, who's shown excursion and dispersal events um, anywhere from a half mile to I think as much as 30 miles where a deer has gone and relocated and in some cases went, visited for a while and come right back to where it was born. Hmm. Interesting. Anything else you guys want to cover kind of as a whole before we get into kind of that seasonal look? So I thought maybe we'd start with winter, so kind of that January to March kind of period of time. So um, why don't we start there? Can you guys maybe go over um, deer behavior and, and what maybe a, a day in the life of a deer might look like during that period? Yeah, so during the winter time, it's largely going to be what we would consider the post-rut uh, time of the year. So um, the time after the breeding season, basically. And uh, deer can be as simple and complex if we want to make them. But by and large, during this time of the year, the name of the game is survival and eating. So they're going to be situating themselves close to these primary food sources that are advantageous for winter survival, high caloric food sources, uh, soybean, corn feed, fields, and whatnot. And uh, they're really trying to, balance, uh, trying to work a balancing act between uh, traveling a certain amount of distance and using the energy to get to food. So as long as it's worth it, they will travel long distances, but in most cases they try to adjust their their bedding locations to be close to a primary food source in the winter so they don't have to travel as far, use that energy to uh, survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at that point in the winter they've used up a lot of their fat reserves from the summer, so like Eric said, it's survival. Um, in areas where they might not have access to corn or soybeans, They'll focus on woody browse. They'll look for the new growth on plants from the summer before and kind of clip off the ends of those twigs on trees. Um, and they'll typically not move as far. They're not doing those big excursions in the winter. They're conserving their energy as much as they can. Yep, in areas that don't have quality wintering habitat, the hope is that the deer were able to build up a thick enough fat reserve throughout the spring, the summer, and the early fall that even if they're in the negative and uh, losing more calories a day than they are consuming that they have enough fat reserves to make it through to spring thaw and spring green up. Mm -hmm. So for those does that that were bred kind of earlier in that season is that a direct effect of them looking for kind of anything and everything that they can eat or has that process kind of not started yet where they're kind of eating for two at that point? It there certainly has like they're they're growing that fetus from the the beginning when they're when they are bred. Um, it's not as critical until later as a uh, fawning season approaches, but certainly they're still they're still looking for those extra calories. Yeah, I mean the biological need isn't quite there where they're eating for two, but it's more of a, a psychological need where they they've been through, the, through this before and they know what they're getting themselves into, and they're already starting basically to try to eat to eat for two, um, even though they're not using all of it at this point. And those does that come into the spring with larger fat reserves will typically be more able to care for a fawn in terms of 
being able to produce more milk and uh, raise a healthy healthy fawn because the does come out of winter with a little bit more fat than a doe that might have struggled a little bit more in the winter. So is there anything else unique kind of behavior wise in those winter months that may be starkly different from the rest of the year or is it pretty much just finding food and kind of sticking to that area? They'll typically be in a little bit larger groups in the winter, not always, but that's when you'll see them quote unquote yarding up. They'll be in a little bit larger group sticking close to those feeding areas as opposed to the um, spring and summer when they're kind of more solitary. Is there a reason for that, do you guys know, or, or is that kind of just when one deer finds a good area, others are typically going to follow? There's multiple theories behind it, and I think it changes regionally, but um, as I said, the name of the game is survival, and when there used to be a lot of predators, that was their, that was their prime time to be predated, so uh, strength in numbers, basically, and more deer allows them to find... Uh, food sources that might have been hidden and harder for just a singular deer to find as well as when they're bedding together they're increasing uh, increasing their, their thermal radiation. I think another thing to note though as well is they do a shift to bedding that's more associated with south, fa south facing aspects or slope than other time of the year because it gets the uh, the longest exposure of sunlight and like I said we're that uh, the name of the game is survival. They're trying to keep as warm as possible and lose as less calories as possible. And uh, when you're shivering, you're losing a lot of calories. So anybody that lives in Wisconsin probably knows that one. That's um, why I eat extra in the winter. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all agree with that one. So do you guys have a feel for is predation even today? typically higher during the winter than it is in other seasons or is it kind of stay stable or predation can occur throughout the entire year but by and large at least in terms of adults it generally is increased during the winter time especially in males it's post rut they're kind of this comatose they've lost a lot of fat reserves and a lot of their energy so the adult is going to be predated upon it, they have a higher likelihood of being predated upon in the winter versus the rest of the year. It's also easier for predators to catch deer in deep snow, so um, that's another reason that predation may be a little bit higher in the winter on adults is just because that slow slows the deer down a little bit, and sometimes predators can take advantage of that. Yeah, especially in deep uh, snowfall years, deer legs are small and slender, and they go right through the snow, and it's harder for them to push through deep snow, whereas... Uh, the pads of bears or wolves or bobcats are pretty big and they effectively act like snowshoes and uh, allow those predators to run on top of the snow and chase down deer. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys want to cover for kind of those dead of winter months? I think that during the winter time, a lot of the hunting has kind of subsided and the, at least the general hunting public doesn't think about feeding the deer as much during that time of year in terms of whether it be managing their property for wintering habitat or uh, food plots but I think it's important to note that with antler production it's a byproduct of nutrition and the healthier a deer is coming out of the winter into the spring the less nutrients it has to forward to its body and can then afford to antler growth so um, even though we're not doing a lot of hunting during that time of year it's a very important uh, time of year for both those and bucks. And one way you can create forage for deer during that critical calorie intake time is by creating woody browse. If you chop down a tree for firewood, just leave it overnight, let the deer come in and eat off all that new growth that wasn't accessible when the tree was upright. So we don't necessarily need to put out a bunch of corn in order to meet their nutritional needs. And deer are really well adapted to this environment. You know, they're going to um, take the most advantage they can of that natural browse and their bodies are well um, evolved to to process that. So um, if, you, if you're looking to increase nutritional value for your deer on your property, leave your firewood laying there for an, an extra night, and that can really help. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else people can do, or is that kind of the, the, the best tip that you guys usually give? Yeah, quality timber stand improvement, hinge cutting. Um, so can, hinge cutting, can you explain that? Uh, hinge cutting is a technique that you can use to increase uh, cover, which will help uh, thermal regulation as well as increase available browse. So available browse 
It's basically a term that we use where if a tree is standing, that deer can browse in the leaves. But once it gets above that browse height, it may still be there, but it's no longer available. So if we hinge cut or fell a tree, then those tops, the leaves, the buds, twigs, etc., are now on the ground and available for deer consumption. Interesting. So hopefully you guys can, as a reminder, we're talking about seasonal deer behavior um, and just went on a little bit of a habitat discussion there, but I think that's super useful, especially for some hunters. We say a lot of the time there's no off-season in deer hunting, but a couple of really good examples of things that you can do right there to both keep deer on your property and make sure that they're getting the nutrients that they need. So why don't we move into spring now? We're through winter. Um, for those deer that did make it through the winter, so what's happening now in spring? Well, obviously the main event in spring is that does are dropping fawns. That's um, their primary focus. Um, bucks during this time can be a little more solitary. They're just kind of feeding, starting to grow those antlers, getting ready for the next rut season. Um, but does are going to focus in on a smaller home range. They're going to drop their calves um, in really heavy, dense cover typically. Um, where they can stash that calf, or, or sorry, fawn. I do a lot with elk too, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so they're going to drop that fawn in this dense cover so that they can go out and browse and then come back to the fawn. But for the most part, they're staying pretty close, huh? Yeah, I would say so. They're going to be in a smaller home range than they would be once that fawn is mobile. Mm hmm Yep, and, but surprisingly at the same time, uh, those does will travel a decent distance. I mean, they're not traveling miles, but they will travel a quarter mile, a couple hundred yards away from their fawn to feed. And that's usually a lot of times when people find uh, what they think is abandoned fawn is really not abandoned. It's just the mother is out feeding. She doesn't stay with the fawn um, because she doesn't want to increase the amount of scent in that location. Uh, so she'll go away, she'll feed, she'll come back and nurse the fawn four, six sometimes eight times a day, and she'll always be bedding in sight, usually downwind, so she can tell when a predator's coming. Okay. I think that was a really good point you just touched on there. We do get a lot of calls of people who see fawns and, and may not see the doe, but more often than not, they're, they're watching and they're close. So, um, stupid question probably, but so when they do leave that fawn and then go out and do their thing, are they returning to that fawn based on scent, or is that like some type of motherly memory or, or how does that work? I guess I don't know for sure. It's probably primarily scent. Um, typically if a fawn is in distress, if it is caught by a predator or something, it can also bleat, um, which kind of calls the mother back that way. But I think it's probably primarily scent. Deer rely heavily on their sense of smell. Yeah, I would say scent's probably the primary one, um, as well as... Um, just the audible bleat when a fawn is lost or gets bumped by a predator or human, it'll, it'll start bleeding and the mother is usually not too far away and she'll come back to the fawn and she'll start calling for it and when the fawn hears the mother calling, it'll start bleeding and they'll, they'll communicate in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. So you guys mentioned kind of for, for female deer at least, it's prime time in the spring uh, for giving birth. So how long does that period last? It can be really spread out depending on what the rut was like the fall before. Um, there have been documented cases of fawns born into July even, uh, July or August. Not so much in Wisconsin. We have a pretty tight breeding season, I think, just because of the onset of winter here. Um, but if we got like a warm snap in November or early December and some of those cows, or sorry, I'm talking about elk again. Elk on the <laughs> If some of those does were bred later, obviously they'll give birth later. So it can be pretty spread out, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. It can be spread out. Biologically speaking, we would like it to be a lot closer together. We've had fawns born in August, and we see it every year. And some most of the time, it's probably due to an individual case-by-case uh, -case basis and not, um, that, uh, not a large-scale basis. But um, an interesting uh, fact about fawn birth when the earlier fawns are born in the year and the more likelihood that they're born out all at the same time, the better, um, the more likelihood they're going to make it to survival and not be predated upon. Because basically, the predators on the landscape can only consume so many fawns 
at that given time. And once the fawns start to hit the ground, the predators, mainly bobcats and coyotes and bears, they start to transition their primary food source to those fawns. Um, so if you have all of the fawns or a majority of the fawns born at that same time, predators can't get to as many of them before the remainder, fawn, the remainder of the fawns get their legs underneath them and can start running. So fawns are most susceptible to predation within the first two weeks of their life when they're largely at the stationary stage. And when a predator approaches them, they, they basically know they can't run and being still and quiet is uh, their best bet. So once they hit that stage where they know, well, I have a decent chance of outrunning an animal, then they start evading predators more and more, and uh, the chance of being predated upon decreases. Mm -hmm. And another factor in that is the earlier they're born, close to green up, the longer they have during the spring and summer to get a good fat layer and to grow while there's lots of available browse. So the longer that cat mm, fawn has... To, to grow and to eat as much as it can before things get cold again, the better chance it'll have of surviving the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, in terms of nutrition, another good thing to touch on, we've all seen yearling bucks that are spikes, and we've all seen yearling bucks that are, uh, you know, basket racks, sixes or eights, and largely it's gen not genetics that ha makes the difference there. It's when that fawn was born in that year. So if... Uh, by and large, spikes were probably born later in the year. We call them one minuses and didn't have enough time to, uh, to generate that nutrition. Like I said earlier, uh, antlers are a byproduct of nutrition, um, especially in those early years. Most of the nutrition is going to skeletal structure, muscle mass, and putting on body fat. Anything extra goes into antler production. So those fawns that are born earlier in the year will have more of a chance to put those nutrition put that nutrition to their bodies, and then that following year when they're starting to grow antlers, uh, you got more to go straight into antler production. So what about bucks then? I guess we've talked about female deer, and they're obviously very busy that time of year giving birth um, and a lot of time caring for their young. But So what's, what's a day in the life look like for a buck during that time? Largely the name of game at that part at that point in time is to uh, continue feeding and building their fat reserves to prepare for the next year's rut. So um, deer eat, sleep, and breed basically. Um, the whole life cycle is dependent on leaving a legacy and reproduction. So they're building up their fat reserves, recouping from the winter so they can get ready to uh, do what they have to do again in the fall. And during that time, they, they usually will start at the end of the spring, beginning of summer, uh, congregating together with other bucks in what's uh, called the bachelor group. Mm -hmm. So we had mentioned earlier what people can do with things like hinge cutting um, during the winter to kind of help deer out. Is there anything when it shifts into spring that people may be able to do? Uh, hinge cutting still another great one uh, among other forestry practices. That's the time of year that these uh, these trees that you're cutting are going to start growing back. So um, when you cut down a tree, it's going to re-sprout if it's uh whether it's from the st like a stump sprout or a root sprout or from um, an acorn seedling or what have you and that uh that year's growth the fresh succulent growth is going to be the highest in nutrition and usually the first thing that deer is going to be able to eat coming out of winter so um just continuing an active uh, forestry practices and timber management strategies is going to help you not only through the winter, but also in the spring as well. Mm -hmm. And then just to reiterate, one of the best things you can do for deer in the spring is if you find a fawn, leave it there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because likely mom's within your shot. Really good to reiterate that one. And we're going to talk about the breeding season in a bit here, but one thing I wanted to check on too. So um, you mentioned kind of the, the life cycle overall of a deer, um, eat, sleep, breed. When the male deer uh, breeds a female, are they out of there? Is there is there a period at all of, that they're kind of sticking together? or So there's not a situation, I guess what I mean by that, in spring, whereas you're leaving that fawn, there's no buck in the area kind of prowling around, kind of protecting it at all. It's They're just kind of out of there? Nope, largely the males are out. Uh absentee parents pretty much you'll see um, bucks hanging out with does on occasion but they're not they're not a parent figure by any means they don't contribute in any way shape or form to raising that uh, fawn interesting 
So is there anything else you guys wanted to add for spring? I think a lot of good info there. That's pretty much what they're doing. They're having babies and they're eating food. Hmm. Pretty simple. <laughs> All right, so moving into summer, um, I guess why don't we start with does again? So out of spring, they got hopefully a, a calf that's still with them. Um, so Aha, what's... A fawn. Oh, fawn. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's contagious. That's what so, happens when so, we get a first elk on. We're all thinking about Yeah, right? got elk on the brain. So moving into summer, what's what's that look like now? What's changing? What stays the same? Well, um, the does are going to be a little bit more mobile because their calves are typically mobile by that point. Oh, my gosh. Fawns. So sorry. Fawns are mobile by that point. Um, the fawns will probably still be nursing but starting to eat browse as well. Um, so they're going to be moving around looking for that, that good green leafy browse that they thrive on most. Yeah, pretty much still uh, feeding and preparing for the fall and winter is what uh, both bucks, does, and fawns are doing at that point. The does are still lactating and the fawns are still feeding uh, generally through most of the summer on their mother's milk. Um, during the summer that could be other than winter, one of our times of uh, most uh, nutritional stress, so to speak, we can have hot temperatures, uh, drought-like conditions, and it's really that uh, transitioning time between cool and warm season species where um, it just it's kind of an in-between phase. So um, it, it's, a, it's a time of stress, even though there's a lot of food available, palatability, digestible, um, energy isn't as high, and uh, they're just they're just eating pretty much. Yeah, one thing to note, like Eric mentioned, is that um, those does will be a little bit more able to move around, but typically deer move less during the summer just because it's so hot and that produces a lot of stress and over overheating. So they'll um, generally become a little bit more crepuscular to nocturnal in terms of moving when it's cooler at, at night or at dawn and dusk. All right, I'm not going to let this continue without someone explaining what corpuscular means. So <laughs> we're going to rewind again. So Anna, you got the floor. Uh, crepuscular means that an animal is active at dawn and dusk in those kind of twilight times. They're not truly nocturnal where they're only moving at night. They're not diurnal, which means they're moving only during daylight hours. They're kind of moving during those in-between times. So would you say that weather, along with obviously habitat and food, is really a key driver in how much deer are moving? So you, you'd mentioned in the winter that it's they're really kind of keeping it to a minimum. So on the flip side of that, the, the hot weather does kind of the same thing to them? Exactly. I mean, it uh, has the same results, polar opposite sides of the uh, thermometer, so to speak, but they're going to be bedding closer to their food sources, uh, minimizing energy uh, usage, and just trying to feed as much as they can. So... Same rules apply in the summer pretty much as they do in winter. So is there anything unique with bucks in the summer versus does? Obviously does have um, a little one tagging along that they're trying to keep an eye on. But So what's the summer months look like for a buck? This is typically when those bucks would do those foray, forays that we were talking about where they might go explore some new habitat, especially early in summer before it gets too hot. Um, they'll be dispersing a little bit more once they've gotten some of their fat reserves back and have that energy to move around. Yeah, yearling buck dispersal happens throughout spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, the bucks, like I said earlier, are in their bachelor groups and they're starting to grow those antlers that we all love. So um, they're just putting as much nutrients into uh, their bodies as possible and hopefully growing big antlers. So can you talk about the antler process a little bit? So is there typically a a month or a time of year when they're when they're off versus when they start growing? Yeah, they usually shed their antlers in late uh, summer, early spring, or excuse me, uh, late winter, early spring, depending on where you are, and that sometimes that uh, varies individually. Um, by and large, I'd say February is a pretty peak time. The end of February is a peak time of uh, the shedding season. And um, they'll start growing their antlers as soon as, as soon as the temperatures start growing up, uh, going up, and their testosterone starts uh, starts rising. Mm -hmm. So, antlers the uh, fastest growing living tissue, and um, they can grow as much as an inch or more a day, depending on um, the genetics and nutrients availability. Mm. 
So anything else you guys want to cover for the summer months there? Uh, I just want to cover in terms of antlers. Uh, we, we had talked about this uh, before the podcast, but uh, you hear a lot of people say, oh, look at the horns on that deer, and I know it's a technicality, but uh, there is actually a difference between antlers and horns. So antlers are pretty much made out of bone, a mix of calcium and uh, phosphorus, and they are shed annually, whereas horns, like you'd see on a cow, so to speak, are made out of keratin, pretty much similar material that your fingernails are made of, made out of and uh, they are not shed annually so there is a difference technically between antlers and horns. So if there's nothing else you take away from this <laughs> podcast it is the antler versus horn discussion. Thank you Eric. That is very interesting actually. I don't think I knew all that. So moving out of summer now it's into fall and for I would say generally speaking probably the time where people are thinking most about deer throughout the year um, whether people are checking trail cams, putting out trail cams, things like that. So um, I'll leave it up to you guys if we want to do like by month or just do kind of fall as a whole. I think there's a lot to cover. So um, I'll leave it up to you guys. Well, I think like starting in August is still pretty warm, especially here in southern Wisconsin. So they're probably still not moving too much. Um, and the does aren't really close to coming into estrus yet or, or into their breeding season. So I think August they're pretty similar to what the rest of their summer behavior would be like. Yeah, I would agree with our August and September still pretty much summertime behavior. That's a time where a lot of folks are getting out, planting food plots, hanging trail cameras, uh, deer pretty close, uh, depending on the individual, at um, finishing up their growing process for antlers. So people are getting an inventory of what they got on their property and what they can look forward to in the coming fall. Yeah, during that period, the bucks will shed the velvet on their antlers, which is basically the skin that covers the antlers as they're growing, and they'll start to harden up and become the shiny white antlers that we typically see mounted on people's walls. Mm -hmm. yep. About the time they start shedding uh, their velvet, that kind of corresponds with a slight increase in testosterone production, and then you'll see those bachelor groups start to break up their tolerance between one another, um, starts to fade and they'll, they'll break up into their individual group shortly after. So they're starting to get one thing on the mind yeah, pretty they're, much. They're starting to. And it's to, not yeah. eating and it's not sleeping. <laughs> it's not, nope. So moving into September, what's changing now? So I think September largely is pretty similar to August, at least here in Wisconsin. Not much has changed. They're still feeding on the same food sources. They're still on summer patterns. Uh, deer now, um, have lost their velvet and broken up and from their bachelor group. So I would I would say the main change comes in October, at least in much of Wisconsin. So you mentioned bachelor groups. Can you describe that a little bit? So bachelor bachelor groups are just a congregation of bucks. Um, they're at a point in the year where testosterone isn't so high and they're tolerant of each other and they're just hanging out uh, just like buds. But um, once that testosterone starts rising, they're uh, Antlers harden, they lose velvet, then they'll quickly. Not Their loyalty friends. goes away. Yeah. yeah. And then, and it's kind of ironic too that the time that they're doing that, their antlers are hardening. So they're obviously using them as a tool to, at times, to keep other deer away or fight other deer at that point too. So that's interesting how that matches up. So, what about does? I guess we missed does for August and September. So what's that looking like, kind of generally for a, a female deer? They're still feeding. That's pretty much their goal through the whole year is just feeding and raising their fawn. Um, yeah, I mean, continued feeding and um, increasing their fat reserves, piling on that, um, increasing the energy availability. At that time, their fawn is pretty much able to survive on its own. And we have our deer season here in Wisconsin starts in uh, the middle of September. So at that point, you can harvest the doe with the fawn, and the fawn is likely to survive, so no issues there. I think at that point, largely, she's she's still carrying her fawn around with her. She's still showing her the ropes in some aspects, but she's starting to prepare for next year's fawn at that point. So mm -hmm. uh, by and large, that fawn will stay with her throughout the entire year um, until she actually gives birth to that next year fawn, and then she'll say it's pretty much like a... 
a human turning 18. Well, we've done our job. You're off in the world on your own. And she starts putting all of her resources into that next that next fawn. So that, that young of the year fawn, when they're kind of parting ways, um, is that you're going to be able to breed that year? Or is it going to be another year still before they're able to do that? In some cases, they can, and that largely depends on habitat quality. Um, in northern climates, a fawn, on average, has to re reach a uh, body weight of about 80 pounds before it could potentially cycle. They usually don't reach that weight until uh, December, January, and uh, they can cycle at that time and turn into um, possibly a third rut at, at that case. Okay. So moving into October. What's, what's happening now? <laughs> this is kind of the pre-rut phase where bucks are starting to, well, they're more than starting to think about breeding. They're, they're in the mode. They're, that's when you see them scraping. They're um, rubbing against trees, all that. They're hardening their antlers some more and starting to spar with other bucks if they feel the need. And that sparring, is that typically to kind of defend an area that they've found that they like or more a product of just a ton of testosterone in their body? Initially, it's a product of a lot of testosterone in their body. And I think at first they're sizing each other up. It's nothing too intense. They're building muscles. That's a, in addition to um, leaving their scent and a signpost, rubbing trees is builds their muscles and prepares them for when rut comes and they're actually fighting over a female. So... Um, during that October time, we start to see the acorns dropping and they're shifting from a summer pattern to more of a fall pattern and that usually coincides with what the general public considers uh, October lull, but um, like I said earlier, I guess in the very beginning, deer are the most widely studied big game species in North America and we've done tons of VHF and tele um, GPS studies that suggest that deer do not actually move any less during that part of October than they do at any other times of the year. They're just transitioning um, to a summertime pat from a summertime pattern to a fall pattern, uh, focusing on different food sources. So if you're not seeing them during that time, largely probably in the wrong place and you need to adjust your game. I think that's a good point to make. A lot of people see October, like you said, as kind of that lull, but it sounds like there are opportunities and maybe less hunting pressure if you can get out there and, and follow the habitat. Certainly. And um, as October progresses, speci more specifically into the second half of October, you st like Anna mentioned, you start seeing that pre-rut behavior. Scrapes and rubs start popping up. Um, you'll see an increase in buck activity, especially during the first October cold front. And that time can be just as good as the rut to harvest the mature deer. Hmm. And we've touched a little bit on the hormonal changes they go through too, but bucks will typically gain, especially mature bucks, will gain more mass in their um, neck and shoulders, and that comes both from testosterone and from that sparring behavior early in October. Hmm. All right, so moving through October, I'm going to assume that does are just still pretty much in that holding pattern that we've, we've discussed before, or are they kind of getting to the point where they're getting ready to breed too? Yes and no. Um, so towards the end of October, does can be cycling into estrus, um, and we can cover more of that in the November segment, but it is not an extreme rarity to have a doe ready to breed at the end of October. It's happening. Uh, they're, they're starting to cycle, and their cycles, once, once they get into that cycle, can last anywhere from 20 to 48 hours, and it's kind of a progression. So um, end of October, specifically this time of year, that last week of October, you're, you're really starting to see an uptick in uh, buck activity as well as the does are pretty much on the cusp of being ready for prime time. And another thing, um, just like bucks, their food sources are shifting during this time. You think about it, the leaves are falling off trees. They're not having that leafy browse that they have in the summer. So they're going to be looking for acorns and other food sources as well. So they might start to use some different habitat, just like the bucks are during this period. So for everyone listening, as a reminder, we're talking about kind of seasonal deer movement and behavior. Uh, we've got Eric Cannonia and Anna Bros here with us. Uh, they're from both from the deer program here at DNR. Um, so we're getting to the end of October, and then now we're shifting into what you guys have referenced as prime time a couple times. So where are we at right now? 
So we're in the, um, the holy month of November pretty much. Uh, <laughs> that's when the magic happens and is my favorite time as well as probably majority of deer hunters in Wisconsin, their favorite time to be in the woods. Yeah, this is, we're getting into what we refer to as the chasing phase where bucks are actually going after does. Does are coming into estrus. Um, their hormone levels are shifting and they're receptive to breeding at this point or they will be in the next week or two. Um, so this is really when people tend to see the most buck movement in areas where maybe they weren't seeing bucks before because bucks will start um, doing circuits basically through habitats that they may not normally go to. Just checking for does and and mark you know uh, patrolling their territory and and trying to find those those ladies. Mm -hmm. And would it be safe to say that bucks start making, for lack of a better word, kind of stupid decisions at this point too? Does that kind of come into play, or is that still coming up? Yeah, I mean, about the end of October, to that throughout the first week, or first two weeks, and sometimes the entire month of November, they they don't think things all too clearly they got one thing on their mind and they'll make mistakes so if you're in the woods they're making mistakes you can capitalize on them. Mm -hmm. Another thing to note though too is that they're super keyed into scents at this time of year they are all year round but they are sniffing every twig and branch that they pass they've either got their noses down sniffing for other bucks or receptive does or they've got them up in the air checking the wind so they may make some mistakes because they're focused on finding those does, but they are still very keyed into any scents that you're leaving behind. So when they're looking for that scent and looking for a doe to breed, are those does only leaving that scent that they're picking up when they're cycling, or is that kind of a all-the-time type of thing this time of year? This is kind of where it gets complicated, because as we mentioned previously in the podcast, uh, a buck begins to experience increase in testosterone throughout throughout the year and it's slow and gradual whereas a doe doesn't experience an influx or increase in estrogen until pretty much right at the rut um, so a buck is gradually preparing himself where a doe will be won't have any sign of it and the next thing I know she's 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 cycling and cycling doesn't necessarily mean she's receptive but she's now starting to produce the hormones and pheromones and uh, that a buck is going to key in on so and during this time we call this the rut of course and um, a lot of folks uh, get, I think get confused on what actually triggers the rut and the rut is triggered largely by a change in photo period, or the ratio of daylight hours to nighttime hours, and that's what triggers an increase in hormone production in these deer. And uh, the photo period changes throughout the entire year, and that the bucks key in on that, and as that changes from spring, summer, and the fall, they're gradually increasing and then spike there right at the end of October. Uh, the does will pretty much stay constant until the end of October, beginning in November, whenever they're ready to go, they feel that spike and they start producing extra estrogen. So so when does hit that spike, as far as kind of behavior and movement, we mentioned the bucks will make mistakes, they'll do weird things. So what what does a doe's behavior look like when they hit that point? Well, she doesn't largely change her behavior. She doesn't go out of her way to seek out a buck. She will frequent scrapes. Scrapes are a major communication tool. I consider them like a Facebook post. And uh, bucks will continue to check those scrapes. And when those does are urinating in them or just depositing any scent, uh, they'll be able to tell when that doe's coming close or she's cycling. Like I said, it takes 24 to 48 hours um, for a doe to complete her cycle. So for at least a portion of that time, she is not ready, but she is producing that scent and that's what those bucks are actively seeking as Anna mentioned kind of running circuits and they're hoping to cross a doe's path who is close to being receptive and uh, when he finds her he'll tend her and he will pretty much try to keep her under his control for that entire time until she's receptive and allows him to breed and usually um, a buck will stay with the doe for 12 to 24 hours when she's receptive and will breed her multiple times and at that time fins off other bucks in the process. So when you say that doe's receptive, does that coincide with being on the cycle or are those two different things? So when they're receptive, they're on the cycle, but they'll start to cycle and start producing those pheromones, those scents, 
um, before they're actually ready to breathe. So when a buck is actively chasing a doe, at least in this time of year, she's starting to cycle. She's producing that scent, this chemical signal that's telling that buck, I need to stick with her. I need to make sure that I am with her when she is receptive, and then she'll complete to where she's receptive, allow him to breed, and then shortly after that, there's a, you know, a narrow 12 to 24 hour window, and after she's done being receptive, she finishes up her, her cycle, and um, the, the process is pretty much complete at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one important thing to note is that, um, as Eric mentioned, the doe's behavior doesn't change all that much. They're still focused on finding good food, um, fattening up for the winter. So during this period, a, a valuable hunting strategy, if you want to go there, is finding those areas that does are using. Um, because chances are there's going to be a buck there if, they're getting, if the does are getting close to, mm -hmm. to being able to breed. Yeah, good strategy is you find the does, you're going to find the bucks, especially during that time. So if you can't get eyes on does but think you may be in kind of the right vicinity, are there other things you can look like, look for other than physically seeing female deer in the landscape? Is there a type of habitat they'll frequent? Or? Well, as Anna said, they're, they're still focused on eating as much as they can. So finding that food source at that time of year, which is largely uh, recently harvested agricultural fields, um, does are out there feeding in the evenings, and the bucks are going to be soon to follow. Mm -hmm. Another thing you can look for is dense bedding cover. You know, they, they might be out eating in the field during the day, but they still need that really dense cover we've talked about with hinge cutting and, and everything else. So if you can find those bedding areas where they're spending kind of their off-duty hours, um, bucks are going to be keyed into that as well. And I think another habitat feature that's often overlooked during that time of year, it's not hot, is water sources and when a buck is being or when a doe is being chased all around or a buck is chasing a doe actually a buck doesn't have to feed as much as he has to drink so when he finishes breeding a doe he'll immediately go and search for a for another one and if he's going to go anywhere else besides that he's going to go to water drink try to cool down and then go after a doe so so has the window essentially closed for a hunter on things that they can do on the landscape to attract deer at that point? Or are they, are they mostly relying on keying into deer behavior? Or are, they still, are there still things that they can do to kind of increase their odds that time of year? Um, all the preparation is going to happen before that's then going to benefit them during, during that time. So a lot of folks plant food plots because they want to, they want those does to be regularly visiting those food plots, thus the bucks following after them and uh, we've said many times active forest management timber stand improvement is going to make thick uh, woolly areas where those does are going to want to bed so you find those areas where the does are bedding and you can increase the odds that they're bedding in a certain location by making that habitat favorable to them so in the fall you're kind of reaping the benefits of what you've sown the rest of the year yeah absolutely so anything else to add on the rut Obviously, it's such a famous term. Um, I know a lot of people are familiar with what it does to deer, but they may not have been familiar with how it works. Just to touch on something Eric mentioned in terms of the rut being triggered by photo period, I think one common misconception is that it's triggered by the first cold snap or temperature, and that's just not the case. Those does go into estrus and their hormones change based on the number of daylight hours. Now what you might experience is during those first couple cold snaps, deer will be more active than they have been during the warmer um, temperatures. So that's what you're seeing there is they're taking advantage of those cool temperatures. That's not what triggers their hormonal changes, but they absolutely will take advantage of it and be moving around more. Yeah, um, you know, common misconception again is when we have poor weather, people don't see that seeking and chasing phase, they assume that the rut didn't happen and it's just not the case the rut always happens it generally happens the exact same time every single year as it has for many many years um, the weather only affects daytime deer movement so you have poor weather conditions warm weather uh, wet weather whatever the case may be um, you may not see the deer but they're still doing their thing and they're just probably doing it at night mm -hmm. um, i think another thing to note also that um, depending on the buck to doe ratio, if we have a lot of does per bucks, then there's actually a good chance that not all the does get bred 
during that initial cycle. So when that doe cycles, like I said before, she's got 12 to 48 hours uh, to do her thing and she is not successively, successfully bred during that time, her health permitting, she will cycle 20, around 28 days later, um, now into December, in what's commonly referred to as the second rut. So we can ha then have these multiple stages of rut, which is a second opportunity for hunters to, uh, to experience some rutting behavior. But, um, and, it, and it's quite common. I don't think there's any biological reason to be uh, you know, concerned about that. But just to keep in mind that when those situation happens, that means um, those fawns that are bred 28 days, 30 days later, are now gonna have their fawns 28, 30 days later compared to the first group um, and as we talked about before during the fawning season it's better to have those fawns born at the same time and it reduces their chance of predation so so then november obviously we've got the majority of deer hunters are on the landscape december probably starting to tail off but one thing we've been covering is deer movement so the rut time a lot of it's kind of tailored to breeding so as we move into November, does a lot of it now shift to kind of hunter pressure or does that maybe not have as much of an effect as we'd think? Hunter pressure definitely has a significant effect and that as well as weather can have, uh, can dictate whether you see deer movement in the daytime, but kind of after the rut um, in that 28 day or so gap before uh, what potentially could be the second rut, those bucks are immediately going to be feeding and trying to recoup any energy. So knowing when those food sources are at that time of year, keeping the pressure and be low in those areas, you can capitalize on a really nice deer who's going to be a lot more uh, predictable or patternable because he's focusing on food. So then after the rut, um, kind of later into fall, maybe early winter, what are we looking at there before we kind of wrap up here? Well, we're kind of shifting back into that winter behavior that we started with. Um, deer, whether they're does or bucks, are going to be focused on finding those food sources, maintaining or, or even still growing that fat layer if they can. Um, they may move a little bit less. Certainly they're going to move less than they would at the peak of the rut. Um, they're going to key in on those, those thermal cover habitats, that dense, dense, bedding cover that we've talked about and those really high caloric food sources. Just kind of like wrapping up as we did in the beginning, the name of the game is survival at that point. It's still a really good chance, a really good time of year to harvest a buck because he's focusing on food. It's a lot more patternable than he was in the rut. They're unpredictable, but they're on their feet more and uh, they may be moving less, but they're moving more predictable. You could be more strategic, I guess, is what you're saying. Yep. They're moving pretty much from point A to point B back to point A again. So it sounds like the name of the game is kind of how hunters can use this. It's just knowing what deer want, knowing kind of what schedule they're operating on based on what time of year it is. Um, if there's maybe one thing you could tell hunters about how to use what you guys just described here or wildlife photographers, anyone who wants to see deer, whether it's doe, buck, anything, um, kind of what, what is the one thing that you would tell them to kind of summarize what you guys have covered today? I think just being aware of those changes they go through seasonally is very important. Um, I think a lot of people get frustrated when they see deer in one place in the summer, then come hunting season or later in the year. They don't see them in that spot. And it's like, well, where'd they go? They disappeared. Well, those deer are still around. They're just using different habitat types. So understanding why they use those different habitat types can really um, help you get an edge on seeing or harvesting deer. Yeah, and I think it's important to note also with that, not only recognizing the different stages, but uh, understanding that these stages are not concrete and they often blend in to one another. So uh, especially in an individual level. So where your neighbor or your friend might be seeing a different stage or seemingly seeing a different stage at that point and you're not, it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It's just these often blend in together. So just understanding these the cycles and the fact that deer eat, sleep, and breed and getting out there. I think it's important to do scouting all year long. I mean, I I take it as deer season never ends. My favorite time to, to scout for deer are is after immediately after the deer season 
ends. We have snow on the ground. I find their bedding areas, their trails, and picking up sheds. And I use that data, that information, immediately following next year. So some of your best data to use that scouting information isn't acquired in that individual season, but would be acquired the season before. So, Yeah, another really big thing to take away is that deer are animals. They're wild animals. So we can learn as much as we can about them and we can pattern them as best we can looking at their habitat and their nutritional needs throughout the year. But ultimately they're going to do what they want to do, um, whether it's during the rut or in the spring. They're, they can be unpredictable. So, you know, keep at it. Don't get frustrated. They're just doing their deer thing. Don't overthink it. No. Yes. Don't overthink it. And to us, they're or to them, we're predators, so uh, we start doing the same thing over and over again, just like they are. We're going to pick up on what they're doing, but they're also going to pick up on what we're doing. So they're, uh, they're trying to change it up to fool us, and we have to do the same to fool them. So any other closing thoughts before we wrap up today? I think we covered a lot. I think this is really going to be useful for people. It's very interesting. I learned a ton. Um, anything else you guys want to cover? I just think that a uh, good thing to note is you've got to be out there to experience it and uh, just use every experience, whether it's good or bad. As long as you learn from it, you're benefiting from it. And, uh, you know, it's a wild animal. It's going to be unpredictable. And just enjoy it. That's why they call it hunting. If it wasn't, Absolutely. Yeah, if it was easy, it wouldn't be fun. As my dad always said, it's why they call it hunting and not going to the grocery store. Yep. Exactly. Um, I would say just uh, especially for people who are just getting into hunting to to get out there um, throughout the year as we've mentioned you can always figure out deer sign and and what kind of habitat they're using during which periods of the year um, I might be a little bit bi biased as a biologist but my favorite part of hunting is just kind of doing the investigative stuff and figuring out where those deer are and why they're there and using that to the best of to the best of my abilities to fill my freezer mm -hmm. during hunting season. I think both good closing thoughts there. Um, thanks for listening. We're definitely going to have Anna and Eric back on. I think that was incredibly um, interesting. They covered a ton of stuff. Um, so thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Wild Wisconsin Off the Record podcast. Um, you can find this episode. Uh, we're going to title it Deer Behavior and Movement and all the other episodes. We got a lot of other deer content and everything else, no matter what you're interested in. Um, you can find it at dnr.wi.gov, keywords Wild Wisconsin. Um, you can find it on our YouTube channel, which is WIDNR TV. And then you can also search Wild Wisconsin off the record on iTunes, Stitcher, and Podbean. And that's going to come right up for you. You can download them, whether you have Apple, Android, any of that stuff. Um, I'll also do a quick plug for the app, Hunt Wild Wisconsin. You can find that on our website at Hunt App. It is free. Um, it's going to help you mark a lot of the spots that Eric mentioned with bedding um, and things like that. So that's going to be a useful year-round tool for you. Um, and then always remember to check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages. We share a lot of content that's like this. This is obviously a little more long form, um, but a lot of quick hitters from people like Anna and Eric uh, kind of sharing their knowledge with you, which I think is really going to benefit um, the people in the field. So thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time on the Off the Record podcast from Wisconsin DNR.